how it fits in really well with syntropic farming and also for broad acre farmers who are trying to build up their organic matter really quickly. Okay, if you're challenged by the system of having lines of trees from paddock, one of the ways you can start the process is by cover coffee. Now, there's a guy in North Dakota, Gabe Brown, who's done this really successfully. He hasn't cultivated since 95, which is where we're heading. We're going to eventually get rid of all the form of cultivating at all. The biggest problem we have in our agricultural system is 95% <clears throat> of our crops are annual crops, which means every time we go in to plant an annual crop, we destroy the ecosystem. Okay? We need to be working more towards perennial crops, where we once we start to develop the system, we're not constantly going in and destroying it. I have seen this time and time again, when we go in and try and do as little as possible, but every time we turn the soil, especially in the tropics where we have a lot of sunshine, every time we turn the soil, we're destroying life. Okay, in some cases it's a necessity. We're trying to find every way possible that we don't have to have as a necessity. So we grow, you can see we've got garlic growing here, we grow turmeric, we grow potatoes, we grow corn, onions, leeks, we grow a multitude of different things. But we're trying to get away from actually doing what we've done in the past, which is ploughing, disking, scarifying, rotary hoeing, all these things which are all greatest destroyers of soil structure. Okay? So cover crop is a really big part of the system. For me, when I see alleys of trees and I see grass growing between it, which is having to be worked constantly, mowed or whatever, that's a lot of fuel going into that energy. Whereas we can be using that in, in, intermediate airstrip as a means of being able to produce organic matter, producing a feeding zone for mycorrhiza and for the root system of those plants to build spread across. A lot of avocado orchards have gone up all over the tablelands, I'm sure you've seen. They have these huge laneways between their avocados. They're bringing in mulch because they all know now that they need to mulch their avocados. So my neighbour just put in 50 acres of avocados. His mulch bill, just for his own mulch that he grows himself, is $40,000 a year. Okay, he's had to buy a big bale buster, $56,000. He needs a big tractor to run the bale buster. Now he could grow all his mulch between his rows of trees. And in the same time he's building his soil between his trees, he saved himself a lot of money. He needs one pass to blow all that in the, underneath his trees. Now, if you do that just prior to harvest, so it's easy for the tractors, when that mulch starts to break down, those trees have just had all their fruit taken off them. They get a huge surge of energy from that mulch. Okay, so it's working in many facets. All right, I just wanted to read you something here that when you hear when it came from, you realize that this is not new. <clears throat> Where no kind of manure is to be had, I think the cultivation of lupins <clears throat> will be found <clears throat> the readiest and best substitute. If they are sown about the middle of September in poor soil, then ploughed in, they will answer as well as the best manure. Columella, first century, Rome. <laughs> Okay, so cover crops are new, are new things. The Chinese were doing it 3,000 years ago. However, there's been a resurgence of this, especially in America. They're really way ahead of us here. In trying to get away from the use of herbicides, cultivation, in order to try and rebuild these soils that have been destroyed. Okay, we all heard about the, the dust bowl days and all of that. They're realising that if they keep going the same way they are, not all of them, a lot of them that they will end up back where they were. Okay, so what we're going to have a look at is some cover cropping, how to do it, what's the bad, what's the benefits, and how you can do it in your system. Okay, so this is our farm. Okay, so as I said, our main crop is garlic, but we do grow other things as well. So we try to fit this all into a rotational system. We now starting to grow lines of trees as well because we're going down the line of syntropic as well. Okay? So the confusion as to cover crops, green manures and catch crops, they're all roughly the same thing. 
Okay, they're just depending on how you use them. So a cover crop is basically using plant material to cover the soil. Okay, and this can be from anything from your weeds right through to a multi-species planted cover crop. Okay, green manure crops are a cover crop, but they're deemed as being something that you then actually turn in to build soil organic matter to be able to hold it up onto the nitrogen and so forth in your soil. And then catch crops are very similar again in that they are grown in between a cash crop and their job is to be able to grab hold of any nutrients that have been left behind so they don't get washed away. Okay? Again, that will then be turned in so it's similar to a really new crop. Okay? So what we can use is we can use anything that grows. Okay? You can see it we're walking around, we've got different grasses, we've got different legumes. There's glycine growing on everything. <laughs> Okay, Lysini is the most fantastic green manure crop. It's a legume. Okay, do you understand the difference between a grass and a legume? Is everyone totally clear on that? Because this is really important. Legume grow beans? Yeah, they grow beans, but it's, it's what they actually do. No, they don't fix nitrogen. Right, the bacteria that lives in the nodules on their roots fix the nitrogen. So if I weren't there, then you wouldn't have the not you wouldn't have the... No, they're free-fixing nitrogen. As a tobacco is, enough, is one, it's a free-floating nitrogen fixer. But legumes have got created a symbiotic relationship between rhizobia bacteria. They produce the housing, which is the calcium shell, which is the nodules. The bacteria has a free house, and in, in, for paying rent, it will harvest the nitrogen and feed it to the plant. And the plant, in turn, will feed it sugars. Okay, so they have this symbiotic relationship. Okay, but if you don't have the rhizobium bacteria there, you're not going to get nitrogen fixation. Okay, so this is really important you understand that. If you haven't inoculated your seed and your ground has not got that bacteria in, you will not be getting that nitrogen fixation happening by that leaf. Okay. What do you mean by inoculating? You inoculate it with the right rhizobia for that species. So if it's peanut, or if it's uh, cowpea, lab lab, yeah. lupin, peanut, you know, you name it. They all have different strains of rhizobia that work with them. You have, well, you normally go along and you buy it from your seed producer. Your seed merchant will be able to get you the right grass. So that's what I've been trying to say before the rain season. You should plant the grass with some legume Absolutely. that will actually the legume will uh, create conditions for the grass yep. and then that will help that will happen that relationship between the inoculant and yep. the grass yep. so you have nitrogen fixing in the system so when you're gonna start doing your crops it's uh, the soil is way better mm. isn't it yeah, yeah just, uh, so the yeah. legume can produce nitrogen for itself so you can plant a legume which has been inoculated into a nitrogen deficient soil and it will grow well where the grasses won't okay because grasses are hungry for nitrogen okay they rely on the free floating azotobacters or what is one of them the free floating bacteria that can fix atmospheric nitrogen okay so when you when you're doing a green crop and i know a lot of green people who do green crops their green crop is sorghum it's quick, gives them a bit of bulk, and then they're turning it in. But they've missed the whole picture. Okay? So what we're doing is we're trying to harvest. So when you look at this system here, so this is your flat paddock, okay? That's your photosynthetic area. Okay, so we're growing in. So you can measure that as one acre or one hectare. Okay? When we look over here, okay, so this is, this is growing it with either alley cropping or syntropy, where you've got your canopies. Okay, so you've got all your different canopies going here. In the middle here, this is the strip that's between. This is where you can do the same again. You put your multi-species cover crops in. So we've got, you'll see, see, look at the, look at the size of this. Okay, so we're using corn and sorghum. Okay, massive amount of bio, they're the greatest harvest of sunlight. Okay, C4 and C3 plants, they're carbon collectors. Okay, so by developing that, so in here, I'm doing the same thing again. Beans, okay. um, 
brassicas. Okay, we've just been having a look at an area that's really compacted. So who hasn't got a ripper? Who hasn't got a tractor? So how can we speed the process of that up without actually having to go in there with a crowbar and think we can use plants to do it? Okay, a lot of brassicas. So the two brassicas that are really available now is tillage radish, okay? And there'll be pictures of these coming up. And fodder turnip. These produce massive root systems. Tillage radish is like the daikon. So, you know, you're getting a radish this long. Half will be in the ground, half above. But its actual root will probably go down two meters. And they will bust through compaction. So you can actually use those as a form of tillage. That's what we've done. We've grown them. And then the holes left by the radishes, when they start to break down, that's a nutrient cup. It's full of nutri nu nutrition, a lot of nitrogen there. You plant next to that, you're feeding your plants straight away. Biologically available nutrients. Okay, but you've also broken up the soil. Next okay. to it or through it? Through it. Through it. Sorry. Yeah, well, if you're going to grow a green manure crop or a cover crop, you're generally doing that as a preparation before you put the cash crop in. Within the same hole he's talking about, that hole. Yeah, you can plant right in the same hole right next to it. Yeah. Yeah. And herbs as well, that's another one. So as I said, green manure, cover, catch crops. It's again, don't get caught up in the terminology because they're really, at the end of the day, they're all doing pretty much the same job. It's a purpose of the catch. Yeah, it's just depending on what you're looking to get out of the system. Okay? So you might be growing green manure crop that you then turn into the soil, okay, before you plant. Or you might do a cover crop where you just mulch it and you leave it on the surface to keep the ground covered, okay? It depends on what you're looking for. What crops are you growing? What's the system that you've got in place? This is all has to do with management. So again, it comes down to what are you after? So here you go, this is a daikon radish. Okay, so it produces this huge root. We've, we've dug ones up that about this long. Okay, they are fantastic busters of compaction. Not only from this part of the root, but the root bit that goes on the end, which is like a string, that will work its way down through the soil. Okay? So here we've got, again, this is in the orchard. We're developing the beds where we're planting fruit trees. So we've got these mowed areas between from management point of view. But here we've got multi-species cover crop. We've got sorghum, sunflower, millet, uh, cowpea, goycos lab layer, potter, potter turnip, Tillage radish uh, and a whole lot of other flowers as well. We like to plant a whole lot of flowers as well because it's also important not only to create energetically, being, you know, we're biodynamic so we work a lot with energies. Flowers don't only create energy but they're also really important for beneficial insects and also for bees. Okay? So the more you can incorporate into your mix, the better. So, how they work? So, again, the basic principle of what we're doing here is to Build organic matter, adding organic matter to your soil. Okay? The fact is, is that if you keep a cover crop and then straight into your next crop, your cash crop that is, and then cover crop, which is what we do. We normally do two cover crops, one cash crop. Okay, so we have a living root in the ground you do all the time. Now, those of you who know about mycorrhizal fungi, they require a living root. They can go into sporulation where they can go dormant. But it's much better if you can keep them going the whole time. All right. So having that living root in the ground is important. So this is where cover crops fill the gap. Now I'm sure you've been around the table and just got a lot of bare soil from there. Okay. They've harvested their summer crops. They're now waiting. Maybe they'll put a winter crop in, or they'll leave it until the summertime comes again. And all that time, that ground's been cooked. So you've lost all your microorganisms. You burn off most of your volatiles, your nitrogen. Your worms, if you've got any at all, have gone so deep, you know, it's becoming what we call a dead system. It's not dead, but it's probably what it is. Okay? So they can add nitrogen. So you put in legumes. When those legumes are turned in, you're putting all that nitrogen back in an organic form. Okay? Suppressed weeds. Fantastic. You, you see some pictures here. Some of the Farmers around me have a real problem with brachiaria, which I, was interesting. It's, you noticed that was in the, the 
the YouTube. Uh, they see brachiaria as the enemy. So they want to try and get rid of it. But their system doesn't allow for it to happen because they constantly take and take and take. And the brachy is actually trying to restore balance the whole time. So by actually replacing them by putting the organic matter back there and actually keeping the ground covered, they don't need to be there. All right? Suppressing nematodes. There are certain <clears throat> root feeding nematodes in a conventional system where you're using a lot of herbicides, fungicides, and insecticides, you will be destroying most of the beneficials, and therefore you get these rise in the pathogenics. Okay, and some of these nematodes, the root knot nematode and one or two others, which do a lot of damage, especially the sorghums and stuff that produce a certain amount of prussic acid has an effect of being able to lessen their amount. Okay, also with the use of things like brassicas, any of the brassicas, they produce, when they break down, by Okay, these are like gases like ethylene um, in the soil, which actually work as the same as of being able to help reduce the number of pathogenics that you've got. Uh, reduce erosion, increase infiltration of water. For us up here, this is, and I'm glad to say it's a big surface, is one of the most important things. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried doing the infiltration test, it's where you put a pipe on the ground and you pour water into it, and you see how long does it take that water to actually be absorbed. Okay? Now, you put in enough there, so you put, let's say you've had a, we get a storm, you get three inches of rain in a storm, you want all that water stored in the ground. Okay? Where does most of it go? Most of it goes in the creek and it takes most of the fertility with it. Okay, the rivers run red around here when we get heavy rain, and that's all our children and grandchildren's inheritance gone down the drain. So we want to hold that. So we need to build our soils. To build our soils, we need to be humus farmers. Humus is created by the breakdown of organic matter by microorganisms. So humus can hold up to 10 times its own weight of water. So it's like a big sponge. So you imagine you can hang on to three inches in your soil without becoming waterlogged. And that then can be feeding back, especially when you start growing plants that can pull that water back up into the system. Okay, this is where the eucalypt is fantastic. Okay. You're decreasing nutrient loss and attracting beneficial insects. So you can see it's got many purposes. This is just the basics of it. When you start utilizing them, you realize it's how many more they can be. So, what to plant as a cover crop? We're very lucky up here. I've traveled around doing a few workshops around Australia. Most places don't have the benefit that we have here that we can grow winter crop and summer crops. We can actually be cropping all year round. Down in South Australia, they get one crop a year. So when I start talking about green manure crops and cover crops, and they go, we've got to grow a crop, a cash crop. We don't have time to grow a green crop. It's not actually true, it's just that their system is that's what they developed. There's pasture cropping, the other systems that actually can change that. So when you look at it, there, there is a, this is only some of them, this is not all of them. You start researching and go on to bing.com is a good one, they can show you a huge amount of different cover crops. Whether you can get the seed here and others is a challenge, where in America there's a much greater variety of seed and it will happen here in time. So summer crop, we're looking at. So look at the grasses and legumes, it's the main mix. You've got to grow those two together. If you're going to grow a green manure crop, grow as many species as you can. The more species you grow, the more diversity you have, the greater area that you're covering all the things you need. Okay, sorghum, millet, corn, sugarcane. Sugarcane is actually a good green manure crop. However, you have to be on top of it because it'll want to come back and stay there for a while. Okay, that might not be what you want. Okay, but it does produce a lot of Biomass. Legumes, lab lab, uh, cowpea. Lab lab comes in the two varieties you can get here. You've got high worth and wrong guy. High worth is very fast, doesn't produce a lot of biomass. Wrong guy, he is the right guy because he does grow a huge amount of biomass, is very aggressive. Um, as I'll show you some of the pictures here. Very useful in quite a few of the systems if you're doing a cover cropping system for two or three years. Okay? Um, soybean, sun hip, mung bean, 
And then, of course, there's the other things like buckwheat, sunflowers, and there's all sorts of different herbs you can use. Um, again, these are all annuals. Okay? There are perennials you can use. We see uh, pigeon pea can be used as a perennial. Okay, then there's some of the clovers, subterranean clover, crimson clover, the seam clover. These are all can have the potential of being biennials, some of them even perennial. Again, it's depending on what you're looking for. The winter one here, again, this is something that we can grow up here on the tablelands. We can actually grow a lot of the temperate um, cereals. Oats, barley, rye, wheat, and rye grass. These are all grasses that are grow. You don't get the mass that you get in the summer, and you might have to irrigate. This is one of the, the downsides of the winter ones is we don't get a lot of rain in the winter, and therefore you might be relying on irrigation, which is another cost you have to involve. Okay? Legumes, again, clovers, field pea, vetches. There's about 140 different varieties of vetches, from woolly pod, hairy, um, oh, it goes on and on, okay? Beans, broad bean, and lupin. Lupin, what the Romans were growing. Okay? If you can't get manure, then you know lupin will do the job. Tennis radish and polyturnip. Again, this is bringing in the, those ground breakers. Okay, so these are, these are what we put into all our mixes. I try to get up to 21 species in a mix. Okay? To try and cover every angle I possibly can. Could cassava be one? Uh, cassava could be. Uh, it would be more like in a perennial system or a biennial. You know, anything like pigeon peas, they, you look for them, their mass of production happens not in the first year. Their most biomass is not produced in the first year, but maybe the second year. So they can be used in that system. And again, you know, we're doing exactly what Neil was doing. He's doing the same thing in a way. Okay? You're using that system in order to be able to harvest biomass, okay, to be able to build, build the soil. Okay? To me, perennial systems are better in that you're not, every time you go in and cultivate, you're destroying an ecosystem. Okay? This is a guy in Western Australia, a biodynamic farmer there. So what he does is he grows his brassicas, he grows a green manure crop in between them, okay, which is um, and then also in the system where you're doing bed systems, your paths need to be looked after. They're not just a path, okay? These are a source of your microbiology. If you're cultivating your beds, okay, then you need to re-inoculate those. So you need to look after your paths. Your paths actually become the bank of your microbiology. And so they will then re-inoculate your beds. So you need to look after them. So, all our paths in the garlic and everything, we grow green manure crops. These are winter crops, okay? So he's got a mix of clovers, uh, brassicas, and uh, Italian rye grass. Um, two clovers, uh, a lucerne, chicory, and plantain. Okay. Excuse me, Adam, do you know of a good source of um, uh, organic or biodynamic seed of those things in Australia or available? Um, Sorry? Uh, yeah, I don't know if you'd be able to. Green patches deals better with bulk. Um, I try to source seeds from anywhere I can. Okay. There's another one called the lost seed Harvest as well. Our own and reseeding with our own is one way. It's a lot of work. Yeah. You know, we do a lot of seed collecting already. Mm. Uh, because I, I, that's part I enjoy, but it is a big job. Um, so the way you can do that is you allow that that actually cover crop to go to seed. You allow it to go to seed, and then you can actually then drop the seed back where it is. And if it's a winter crop, it generally won't have to come up in the summer. It can do, but generally not. It will then regrow the next winter. So we, we've got some here. This is just. We grab this as we were leaving. This is what's growing in the old garlic strips. I'll let them grow for a year or two. So this is the flower of chicory. We've got white clover. Then we've got protelaria here, which is rattle pod. This is a legume. Uh, we've got lucerne. This is lucerne growing here. So the limit will be your imagination. Okay. When you start looking, you'll be amazed at where you can source this. Now, 
I was talking to Jane about this earlier. One of the issues is, is that, you know, bag of tillage radish, well, that's going to be a huge area. Uh, and that'll cost you probably 90 bucks. So, you know, this is one of the issues that small scale people have is, is that I only need a cup for So, by actually, there's a group of us on the other tablelands that we actually share seed. So, we'll buy it and then we spread it up so that, you know, we're getting what we want fresh every year. You can store seed. Uh, if you're buying seed in and you don't know how it's been grown, you might not have long, long germination on it. If you store it properly, either in a freezer or in a, in a cold room, you might get better. But again, it's just, it's not worth hanging on to seeds. But to plant, to get it growing, and the next year get a new seed. Okay? So you can cultivate and drill, which is the classic way. Okay, which is going in, destroying your ecosystem, whichever way you want to choose. And then you're going in and drill it. Now that might be using a seed drill, it might be a little hand push drill, or you might be broadcasting by hand. I've done all of these. Um, we have a guinea fowl on the farm, which, which is our bug control. Uh, they love it if you just go out and broadcast seed. They just come up and clean it all up. So we have to actually plant it in the ground. Okay. Uh, direct drill, zero till. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. It's not what we do. Uh, it's whatever works for you. Um, self seed or broadcast. Broadcasting can be done either with a spreader or again by hand, and you can broadcast into um, the existing mulch. So if you've grown a crop and you've left the mulch behind, you can broadcast into that. Okay. Uh, if you've got a you've got a herd of goats or sheep, you can charge them across the paddock, and they do a great job of dibbling it in. Okay, they used to use them also for turning hay, you know, in a paddock of hay, they would run them around the paddock and they would actually turn the hay. Okay, so again, you know, your imagination is what will limit you. Um, soft seeding, where you're allowed just to drop the seed, uh, we'll, we'll grow some green manure crops for three years. One, one planting, okay, three years of growth, okay, but we have the, the benefit that we can actually set aside something for three years. For most farmers that I know, they're squeezing every bit of ground they've got as hard as it can go. Okay? That's why the system's failing. Now there's a seed seeder. You'll be able to show you a picture of that. A seed seeder is basically it's a seed box, it has wires on springs. There's a hole size you can set. Um, this friend of mine, um, he has it mounted on his front end loader, he's got a mulch on the back. He drops the seed for his next cover crop into the existing crop and he mulches straight over the top, job done. He hasn't opened up the soil in his orchards for two generations. Okay? Okay, so we've got here, just to show you the, the mass of biomass here, which is mainly uh, sorghum, really cheap, quick summer green crop. I allow the sorghum to grow to full height, which is up to 12 to 14 feet. Okay, I have a massive amount of carbon and this huge carbon frame. The Dolicos Lab Lab takes a bit of time to get going. Once it gets going, it will climb right up that frame and eventually pull it down. And you'll see some pictures where it's completely pulled it down. You can't see the sorghum at all, but it's all underneath. Now, if you've ever made compost, you know it's all about nitrogen carbon ratios. Okay, so here, this is the perfect nitrogen carbon ratio. So you're building compost in your paddock. Okay, and nature's doing it all for you. So those of you who make compost, and we make a lot of compost, energy, fuel, time. Okay. Again, this is what it looks like when it's been mulched down. Okay, so you can direct plant straight into that. Okay. No, it's a mulcher. Oh. So the difference between a slasher and a mulcher, a slasher is a single blade or two blades, it chops it and windrows it all. Whereas a mulcher has a rotating drum with flails on it, blades, it chops it and lays it evenly behind it. Okay? So from our point of view, I don't want windrows of organic material, I want it spread over the whole paddock so there's no bare soil. Okay? So then we can go directly into that part in that, or we can then turn that in if we want to, depending on what we're looking at. Okay, here, a friend of mine, he's um, Glenn Drury at Melanda. He's one of the 
outgrowth from Mungali milk. So what he's got growing here is a winter green manure crop that he's actually using as fodder as well. So this is what he's got. He's got a mix of oats, he's got brassicas, he's got woolly pod vetch, he's got clovers. Yeah, that's pretty much. And he's got a few weeds growing in there as well. They will bring in minerals. You know, weeds are the guardians of the soil. They're actually herbs, they're not weeds at all. And so here what he does is he's strip raising it. So what he gets is he gets the benefit of all those root systems, and he also gets the benefit of all these cattle actually disturbing this topsoil and the manure that they put there. The manure and urine, okay? He actually doesn't use any fertilizer. Because he's got his system working, he's got the microorganisms working. So, methods of incorporating, mulching, um, that's leaving it, and then leaving it on the top, or mulching and rotary hoe or just carrying it in to create a seedbed. <coughs> Grazing, <coughs> crimp rolling, which is done a lot in America. We, I've seen trials done here, it's not so effective in the tropics. They're relying on an annual. They roll it with a, a special roller that's got, basically it's got sharp bars on it. So as it rolls, it crimps the stem of the plant, which kills the plant, okay? The difference being is when you mulch the internal part of the plant to the atmosphere, which oxidizes. You see that mulch was brown, but it's green when it comes out. By the time you've gone up and come back and gone again, it's turning brown, it's oxidizing. So you are losing something. If you crimp roll, most of that energy is returned to the soil. The problem we have here is, is that unless you get a really good winter, because most in America they get winter kill, we don't get that winter kill here so much. We get a bit more up where we are because we can get frost. We've tried rolling and all it does, it just makes it tiller even more. Okay, And so it grows again, so you're not actually getting rid of it. And then it becomes a nuisance in your cash crop. Okay? Crimp roll of winter kill. Again, this is not something that we get a great deal here. Here you can see these are friends of mine who do market gardening. They grow a green manure crop. They then they mulch that in and then they actually put a tarp over the top of it. Okay, which prevents the weeds and everything being a problem for them in the next crop. This is not something they're going to be doing permanently, it's until they built their soil to the point where those weeds and things aren't an issue. But it is a quick way of being able to, on a small scale, being able to, without turning the soil, being able to create a seedbed. Okay? Here he's got, this is Kaluna P. These are these citrus trees. These were, some of these were planted in 1920, 1936. Still in massive production today. Okay, they've been in an organic system though for three generations. Mm -hmm. So what he does here is, during the winter time he grows prairie grass, this is in the Hunter Valley. He grows prairie grass, which you can see growing here. Okay, and there's of course there's a mix of other things. He grows all sorts of different herbs between the trees. In the summertime he grows Kaluna pea, which is a form of cow pea. So he has a sea seeder on the front, which just drops that seed into this crop and he runs the mulch over the top, and that's it. That mulch coated. Now, some people say, oh, but I thought you run into problems when you plant directly into a green crop that gets hot, there's this and that. It happens in nature all the time. Mm -hmm. If you were to pile up a vast amount of green material, and there was no air for it, it can get hot. Most of the systems that you're looking at is, the actual layer of organic matter you put on the soil is that much. It might not look much, but it's doing a great deal. Okay, and you're constantly building. In no time, all that's all gone. That's why in the tropics, we have to constantly feed that system. Guaranteed that you the mulch that's out here in six months' time, there won't be much left, unless Jake can put more on it, or blowing in a cover crops or whatever to keep building that system. Okay? So just a few pictures of where you see. So this is in the vineyard. Okay, the vineyards here, grain cover crop in between to build the soil between there. So turn that in or they might graze it. And I know a lot of vineyards now are starting to use sheep because what the sheep do is not only do they graze that, they also put manure in there, but they actually prune all the suckers coming off there, which saves them <laughs> job. Okay, 
So this is another one here. This was uh, corn with soybean growing between it. Okay? And the soybean was growing to promote that biosphere. Okay? Um, this is spotted turnip. So this grows about this tall. The, the turnips can grow about this big underground. Okay, so when that, you can harvest that and feed it to livestock, or you can leave it to feed the microorganisms. It's a huge storage of nutrients. Okay, woolly pod veg, fantastic legume. However, plant it once, you've got it forever. Okay, it can be really invasive. It can actually grow up and pull down a whole corn crop. Okay, so again, it's about a management thing. So here we've got a mix of different things growing, sorghums, lab labs, cow peas, all the weeds that grow as well, because they're all helping. So this is where we started to do alleys of trees, okay? So we just started off here, we've got the growing polonia. Mm. The growing polonia because when that big polonia thing came out, we, we were helping a grower up here, we never got paid for hiring our equipment, we were given trees. So we planted with 800 colonias and realised that we're not in the right area to grow colonias for timber because we don't get rain in spring. However, we've had a whole lot that are still growing, but in this system they're fantastic. They grow fast, okay? In one year you can get 25 feet of growth, okay? If they have leaves this big, okay? so they leaves. produce a lot of biomass. <laughs> We can chop those down every year and coppice them and put all that back. Or we can let them grow into timber trees. They produce abundance of flowers. The whole tree is covered in flowers in the spring. The honey flow off that is fantastic. <clears throat> Native bees love it. <clears throat> Lucina, we've actually got grandis and palita and African mahoganies, pigeon peas, all growing in these gardens as well. And then in between it, this is where we're doing the trials of looking at how can we incorporate syntropic farming into a existing system, but also a broad ecosystem. So we're doing trials with three widths of tractors between the trees, five and seven. Okay, can we grow annual crops? We're not gonna stop growing annual crops right now, we're going away from it. So um, we need to have a system where we can use tractors, headers, whatever it has to be to do the harvesting, and so forth. So you can basically just harvest potatoes in between them? Right? Absolutely, yeah. So you, depending, you know, you three widths. Okay, we've got three widths here. So this is corn growing in between two lines, plus all the green manure crops underneath it. Now we're, we're doing these because this is where we grow our ginger and turmeric, mostly. Okay, so we create the shade, all right? So this is, this is Johnson grass. Now I know that some of you might have seen we have nut grass growing out there. Okay, and cooch grass and Johnson grass, but you haven't got it growing, but we've got it growing. So these, this is all indications of lack of available, biologically available calcium, <laughs> calc uh, compaction, okay, and maybe high nitrates. So these guys are doing a job. They're clearing it up, they're sorting it out, and they're setting it up, this is again, setting it up for the next plant. Okay, the problem in modern agriculture, we're impatient, we don't have time, it's a mess, get rid of it. We've allowed this to grow. First of all, we have nut grass. The nut grass came up as thick as hairs on a cat's back. It was like a lawn. <clears throat> I didn't plant it, but it was there. When we did soil tests, I've got plenty of calcium. But this is a calcium issue. No, it's available biological issue. Okay, we've got plenty of calcium, it's not available. And the same with the magnesium. 